Hello and welcome to the fourth and final lecture of Unit 5. This lecture is going to look at the legacy of the war, and when we talk about that we mean um, the cost of the war, both human costs, like deaths and things like that, but also money. Um, and then we look at the treaty that ends the war, um, and just kind of the outcomes of the war and the terms of that treaty. Many soldiers who survived the war left with no money. Um, and this it goes back to the fact that Congress has no money to pay these soldiers because Congress cannot collect taxes or do anything really that has to do with money um, and on a large scale in order to pay these soldiers. And also during the war, the Congress had to, and the states, had to borrow a lot of money to pay for the war. Because of this, we as a nation are $27 million in debt, and this would be very difficult to pay off because, going back to the fact that we cannot raise money by taxing people because the Congress does not have that power, and then also we can't collect any revenue off of trade, we can't make any money off of trade because our number one trading partner would be Britain, and they're not going to really want to trade with us too much after the war. So instead of paying the soldiers with cash, Congress had to pay the soldiers with land certificates, which are nice, except you don't have any money to build a house or have any crops or anything like that. So really, it's just land that you can't use. So what the soldiers would end up having to do is sell these land certificates just to get basic supplies like clothing and food. Thousands of loyalists after the war lost their property. I mean, they're basically being persecuted. Um, we've talked about persecution a lot in this class, and because people get persecuted, most of the time they, they tend to leave that area that they're being persecuted in, and a good deal of loyalists leave America during and after the war, and most of those loyalists go to Canada because it is easier to get to Canada for a loyalist. Canada is... Um, British controlled, so it's easier to go to, to Canada than it is to load up all of your stuff to get to Britain. The revolution had been like a civil war. What you have to think about here is that a civil war is a war between two groups that were, are within the same country or government, and that's basically the definition of what happened in the Revolutionary War. You have two groups that are underneath the British government fighting against each other. And that's why it was like a civil war. The Treaty of Paris, 1783. This is the second Treaty of Paris that we've talked about. The first one ended the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War. This treaty, um, the 1783 version, ends the Revolutionary War. Americans Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay go to talk peace with the British starting in 1782, and then on September 3rd, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed, basically ending the war and setting up the terms and you know, what this country has to do, what that country has to do, what this country has to give up, so on and so forth. The treaty was good for the Americans. These are some things that it did. The U.S. obviously was independent. The borders or boundaries of the United States would be the Mississippi River to the west, Canada to the north, Spanish Florida to the south. The United States could fish off of the coast of Canada. Each of the sides, both a British and American, would pay, would repay the debt owed to each other. The British would return enslaved people to the Americans, and Congress of the United States would tell people to return property taken from the Loyalists. The first two... Uh, of these things more or less happen. Um, the boundaries are kind of those that are laid out, but you know it's supposed to be Mississippi to the west, Canada to the north, Spanish Florida to the south. The rest of these things, you know, don't happen quite as much because there's no real way to enforce any of these, and both sides don't really want to listen to them. Especially the last one with Congress telling people to return property taken from loyalists. Congress doesn't even have the power to collect taxes. How are they going to tell people 
to return property. I mean, they don't they don't have any way to enforce that. The Treaty of Paris, 1783, led to boundary disputes or you know fights over where the boundary was. The Spanish claimed Florida and both sides of the Mississippi. If you imagine that this is the Mississippi River, what you have mostly most of the time is that this is the boundary of the two sides. You'd have, you know, in the middle of the river, on one side you'd have Spain, and on the other side you'd have the U.S. Just like if you cross the bridge going um, north across the Missouri here in town, you cross from Franklin County, and then in the middle of the bridge there's a sign that says, Welcome to Warren County. So you are crossing in the middle in between these two counties because that's the border. What the Spanish decide is that they don't want to have the middle be the border and this isn't the US over here. What they want is that this would be the border over on this side and then this would be the US. That means that only Spain has access to the banks of the river to be able to get in and you know travel and trade up and down the Mississippi River. The United States, if they wanted to get over here, would have to, you know, trespass, which, you know, they don't want to do because then that would make Spain angry. They, the British refused to give up military outposts in the Great Lakes regions. The Treaty of Paris 1783 redrew national lines without any concern for Native Americans. And what this does is, you know, basically puts thousands and thousands of people, Native Americans, who are living in these areas, you know, they could be under the control of a new government now, and there's really nothing they can do about it. They don't have any say about this or anything like that, and Native Americans' lands are now at risk. Creating a new nation. For the first time, a colony had broken away from the mother country, which would be the country that sets up the colonies, so Britain in this case. This challenged the way the world worked because at this time you have you have some powerful countries that have colonies that are all supposed to listen to them and that means that those the the countries that have the colonies are the most powerful and they're most important and all that kind of stuff and for the first time a colony has said no you are not better than us we are equals and we want to be the same as you. We are going to be the same type of country as you. And, you know, now that this has happened, other colonies and other people living in countries that don't like their governments start kind of looking around thinking, maybe we should break away as well. Maybe we should start our own. Maybe we should overthrow the government. Americans now had to prove that the idea of republicanism could work. And republicanism doesn't have anything to do with political parties like Republicans or Democrats. It's the idea that a country can be governed by the people instead of just a small group of people at the top having all the say, having all the power. Um, it's, you know, voting for your representatives, the people vote, the people decide, the people have all the power, the government works for the people. Um, and they just have to decide, you know, can we make this work? And how are we going to make it work? After the war, most of the states had written constitutions with statements of rights. The states realized that there was going to be a need for a central government if they wanted this country to succeed. Um, they knew now that, you know, the Congress maybe needed to have a little bit more power. They needed to be able to collect taxes in order to set up armies in order to protect us and um, those things. So we will see an increase in the central government. During the war, people began to see the conflict between the ideas of liberty and freedom and slavery. They're fighting a war for, you know, everybody should have natural rights of life, liberty, and property, but we're still keeping people as property. And those ideas don't really match up. So during the war some of the, and after the war, some states outlaw slavery. Most of those are in the north because if you remember the south isn't going to be as willing to get rid of slavery because that's what their whole economy, that's what they make their money, they're living off of the slave system, the um, the plantation system because they're growing those cash crops like tobacco, rice, indigo that require a lot of labor. Defining religious freedom, for many Americans a big part of liberty was religious freedom. Thomas Jefferson proposed the Virginia Statue for Religious Freedom, which said that all people had natural rights 
to freedom of opinion, which included religion. That means that you know people can decide what they want to be or what they want to do. A lot of the that idea of you know freedom of opinion is used as a base for the for some of the rights in the Bill of Rights, which we will talk about when we get to the Constitution. Uniting the states, the colonies had been separate from each other for almost two centuries, and that means that they get used to this idea of doing things on their own. They had their own monies, their their own money, their own laws, their you know own customs, whatever. But now they are seeing that they need to work together, and the challenge is now they need to figure out how they were going to do it, and also you know convincing people that they should you know unify and work together and have a strong central government we're gonna see that they set up something and it doesn't work and they have to go back to the drawing board and you know set up something else so you know we're gonna go through that as we go through um, the next few units setting up our government the early years of you know the United States so that is unit 5